Hello and welcome to this video. My name is Jesper. The topic that I'm going to be covering will be premature infants. We're going to talk about some diseases and complications that premature infants can get, as well as some risk factors for the mother of having a premature birth. So let's start by defining it. So a premature infant is an infant who is born before the 37th gestational week. Premature babies can have a higher risk for several health disorders than babies born on term. They're often smaller and there might be physiological processes in the body that may not have had the proper time to develop due to early arrival. So when we think about these complications, it's important to remember less time in the womb means less time getting ready for life and the environment outside the uterus. So the adaptation of the fetus is not as good as a term baby. It can lead to long-term challenges for the baby and is often a tough time to deal with for the parents with a lot of insecurity. The baby might need to spend longer periods of time in the newborn intensive care unit and they might need to be in an incubator. An incubator is a machine that is designed to make the baby's environment optimal for living in while the organs develop and the body adjusts to the outside environment. It can do many things like regulating the temperature, the humidity, the light levels, and also provide oxygen. So basically everything depending on what is ideal for the baby. Now, one way of categorizing how preterm a baby is, is by using degrees of preterm. So there are four degrees. It's the late preterm, moderate preterm, very preterm and extremely preterm, depending on when they're born. So late preterm would be 34 to 36 gestational week. Moderate preterm would be from 32 to 34th gestational week. Very preterm would be less than the 32nd gestational week. And extremely preterm would be at or before 25. Before we talk about risk factors for preterm labor, first we have to understand the difference between medically induced and spontaneous preterm birth. So sometimes there is a spontaneous preterm labor that is induced by the body. This includes regular uterine contractions with cervical effacement naturally and this occurs before the 37th week of gestation. Sometimes, however, it is medically induced a surgery is done to extract the baby preterm or delivery will be medically induced before term. For example, if the fetus is in danger inside the womb, the only chance of saving that baby would be to extract it or induce a preterm labor. The doctor will medically induce it either by surgery or by medication. Examples that might require medical induction of labor are certain conditions that the fetus can develop, like fetal distress syndrome. The mom might have an abnormalities with the placenta, like placental abruption. There might be ischemic placental disease, or the mother might have preeclampsia. Let's talk about some of the risk factors for giving birth preterm. So risk factor for preterm birth are many, and Maybe the first thing that comes to mind is already having a previous child being born prematurely. So if the mother has a history of a preterm birth with another child, chances are that the next one will also be born preterm. Uterine abnormalities, such as a uterus with a wall, so a septate uterus. There can also be other anatomical abnormalities, like a cervical abnormality. Also, if there is an abnormality of the placenta that is formed, that is a risk factor. If there is a big baby or the mother gives birth to twins, that's also a risk factor. Certain infections, chronic diseases like diabetes, preeclampsia or eclampsia, which basically means hypertension in the mother. Also, there is something called gestational diabetes, where the mother develops diabetes because of the pregnancy. Also, drinking alcohol, using illicit drugs or smoking cigarettes can be a huge risk factor. So, of course, the mother should avoid that. And then there's physical and psychosomatic factors like stress or physical factors like being underweight or being overweight. Now let's talk about some possible complications. 
And important to note here is that not all preterm babies will have complications. Also, what kind of complications and to what degree they will present with is very individual. So I will mention some important and clinically significant ones, not to say that all preterm babies will have these. Actually, being born preterm is quite common, and as much as 1 in 10 babies in the U.S. are born preterm. So when the baby is born, just as with normal term babies, we use the APCAR method to estimate how well the baby is adapting to the outside environment. I have a separate video on the APCAR system and the APCAR score. It's in the pediatrics playlist of our channel, so if you want, you can watch that video. One of the things we worry about is if the neonate will develop breathing problems. An apnea of prematurity is an example of such a condition. So let's talk about apnea of prematurity. This is something often seen in preterm newborns, and it refers to the newborn having breathing pauses that lasts longer than 20 seconds. That's what apnea is, right? It's a breathing pause, an apnea of prematurity. It's breathing pauses in premature infants. Another option that also would qualify or categorize it as apnea of prematurity is if the breathing pauses are there, but they're shorter than 15 seconds. However, at the same time, there is short breathing pauses, but the newborn also experiences relative bradycardia and or reduced oxygen saturation, so slowed heart rate in relation to the normal heart rate. So a reason for this could be that the breathing center would not be fully developed yet. Usually apnea of prematurity gets better, and after a few weeks, the condition ends. If the condition is severe, the newborn might require emergency treatment in the intensive care unit. Actually, caffeine is a medicine that can be used in the hospital. This stimulates the breathing center and thereby helps. Also, physically rubbing the body of the newborn by a nurse or a doctor or a parent can help stimulate breathing. Giving oxygen through oxygen masks is also possible. Sometimes babies are sent home and are required to use a home apnea monitor, which is a monitoring device alarming if the infant would need help. So the next condition we will talk about is also a breathing condition, which is bronchopulmonary dysplasia. This is a type of chronic lung disease, and it occurs due to damage associated with long-term mechanical ventilation and oxygen use. We most often see it in premature infants who have been on oxygen therapy for long periods of time. The more premature an infant is, the higher the risk is for both needing oxygen therapy, but then also for developing bronchopulmonary dysplasia. The diagnosis is made clinically if the baby still needs oxygen therapy at 36 week postmenstrual age, or if it needs oxygen therapy for longer than 28 days consecutively. So why does it happen? Why does bronchopulmonary dysplasia develop? Well, for the neonatal lung, very high oxygen percentages can create free radicals and superoxides. These can then damage the lung, especially when the neonate is very preterm. The lung can be very sensitive to high oxygen therapy. Normally, it would still be in the womb getting oxygenated blood, not from its lungs, but from the mother via the placenta, so the lungs are not yet ready to receive high concentrations of oxygen. So the next one we will talk about is respiratory distress syndrome. And respiratory distress syndrome is a disorder where the preterm infant does not have sufficient surfactant in its lungs. Surfactant is a fluid that helps small air sacs from collapsing, so it keeps them open. If the air sacs are collapsed, they don't allow as much oxygen to enter and oxygenate the blood, essentially. The signs in these patients are cyanosis, so bluish discoloration of either the limbs or the lips, so central or peripherally, a fast breathing, this we call tachypnea, flaring nostrils, so this is when the nose opening of the baby is kind of vibrating, and an expiratory grunt, so a grunting noise on expiration. On a histology test made of the lungs, if one is made, then something called hyaline membranes may be seen. This is often high yield for exams. So if you hear hyaline membrane, think respiratory distress syndrome. Hyaline membranes, respiratory distress. This is a histological evidence of the disease. Treatment consists of giving oxygen to stop hypoxia. A CPAP machine can be used. This may help decreasing the atelectasis, so decreasing the sacs from collapsing. When I say CPAP, I refer to continuous positive airway pressure. Now, other examples of complications can be cognitive delays and learning disabilities. 
Now this might be hard to pinpoint early on since the language skills and motor development happens gradually and slowly for babies. Usually a baby speaks its first word at around 12 months, so you can see the difficulty in screening for cognitive difficulties early on. Also autism might be a little more common in preterm individuals. Now again, most infants born preterm will have no intellectual or cognitive difficulties later in life. So also thermoregulation, which is another word for the regulating of the temperature, is another aspect of the adaptation for the extrauterine life that is frequently reduced in preterm babies. What this means is that it is important to monitor and help maintain the preterm neonate's body temperature. In an incubator, for example, the incubator can monitor the temperature of the newborn and regulate its temperature according to the newborn needs. How a preterm baby is fed depends on its condition as well as its gestational age, so how preterm it is. The infant might be able to be fed normally directly through the mouth, or it's possible with the usage of a feeding tube like a nasogastric tube, or if necessary, total parenteral nutrition. So that would mean intravenously feeding. Also, preterm infants either receive mother's milk or a formula designed for preterm infants. Other complications are infectious diseases. Since the immune system is not as properly developed in preterm infants, they're more prone to getting infections. This is why it is important to follow proper hygiene protocol and sanitation for clinics with preterm neonates. Also for visiting parents, it is essential that they are following a proper sanitary protocol, washing and disinfecting their hands, not wearing shoes from outside, etc. So basic hygienic measures is important. Some serious notable infections that preterm babies can get are pneumonias, meningitis and sepsis, so infectious diseases affecting the lungs, the meninges of the brain, as well as the blood. Also something to note is that respiratory syncytial virus is a viral pathogen frequently causing respiratory infections in preterm babies. Another one is group B streptococcus bacteria. This can transmit vertically, so from the mother to the child. If you're interested in learning more about infections of neonates, then I have made a video on torch infections. You can find it in the pediatric playlist. I also will make a video on pneumonia in children at some point. And on the topic of other videos that I have made, neonatal jaundice is a common complication of preterm infants as well. I have made a video on this topic. You can find it in the pediatrics playlist. It's called hyperbilirubinemia plus jaundice in newborns. All right, so next up we will talk about an important gastrointestinal complication that can happen to preterm infants. I'm talking about necrotizing enterocolitis. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a condition where the intestinal tissue swells and necrosis, meaning it swells and tissue inside the intestines will die. This is a multifactorial disease. There is bacteremia with enteric organisms, so there is growth and colonization of bacteria within the intestines. It's not, however, always due to the same pathogen. That's why broad-spectrum antibiotics is used, because there might be several bacteria or pathogens at the same time colonizing and causing this. It's treated empirically. Under development of the child's intestinal tract is thought to play a role, which also could explain why mostly preterm infants get it. Human milk can actually reduce the risk of acquiring it, some studies show. Now let's talk about the symptoms and disease picture of necrotizing enterocolitis. Babies with this often presents with abdominal distension. They have vomiting, bloody mucoid stools, so like dysenteric stools, hypotension, lethargy, shock, and Sometimes they can present with an abdominal cyanotic color, so the swollen abdomen may look bluish. Radiographic imaging is very important for establishing the diagnosis. A sign that is pathognomic for the disease is a sign called pneumatosis intestinalis. When you hear pneumatosis intestinalis, immediately you should think about necrotizing enterocolitis. So pneumatosis intestinalis necrotizing enterocolitis. Hydrogen gas production by bacteria is present between the subserosal and the muscularis layer of the bowel wall. 
there's essentially gas inside the walls of the intestines. You should Google pneumatosis intestinalis and a lot of pictures will show in Google, like you will not forget it once you see it. Other things you might see is signs of obstruction, such as air fluid levels or intrahepatic venous gas and thickening of bowel loops. Next, I will talk about a very serious complication that can arise, and that's intraventricular hemorrhage. Blood vessels in the brain of small preterm babies are very fragile, especially those of the ventricles. The ventricles are areas in the brain where the cerebrospinal fluid is made. A complication of some preterm babies can be a hemorrhage within the ventricles. It can be associated with concomitant high blood pressure, respiratory distress, tumors or traumatic events and many more. It is graded from 1 to 4 depending on the severity of bleeding. Moving on to the urinary tract system and the kidneys, we will mention nephrocalcinosis. So this is for the kidneys. Hypercalcemia in young infants may lead to buildup of calcium in the viscera of the kidneys. This would cause nephrocalcinosis. So it means there is calcium deposits within the kidney. This can in turn reduce the function of the kidney and damage them. Also important to note here is that kidney stones is not the same as nephrocalcinosis. In nephrocalcinosis, calcium is deposited in the viscera of the kidneys, while kidney stones is formed in the renal collecting system. And therefore, there are movable units that may lodge anywhere along the urinary tract. However, nephrocalcinosis is the deposit of calcium within the viscera of the kidney. And the reason why preterm infants often have nephrocalcinosis is due to the immaturity of the tubular system of the kidneys. Kidney function and minerals such as calcium levels should be monitored, especially seeing as preterm babies receive vitamin D and often also calcium as supplements. For heart defects, I would suggest you to see our video on congenital anomalies of the heart. I will just mention patent ductus arteriosus in this video. In developing fetuses, the blood bypasses the lungs of the fetus via a structure called the ductus arteriosus. It is essentially a connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. It is possible that the ductus arteriosus does not properly close after birth. What this may possibly lead to is pulmonary hypertension. Also, it might increase the risk for the baby to develop infectious endocarditis as well as heart failure can sometimes happen. So normally this structure, the ductus arteriosus, closes a few days after birth. However, if this opening stays or persists, then we call it a patent ductus arteriosus. And this is a heart defect that we sometimes see in preterm babies. I won't go into details for the eyes and ears in this video. However, I will mention that retinopathy of premature newborns can affect the vision and also hearing loss or reduced hearing ability is often seen in preterm babies. Thank you very much for sticking with me through this video. If it was helpful and you want to see more videos like these, please subscribe to our channel to get updates on when we post new videos. Also comment if there is any topic or specific video that you would want us to make in the future. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.